Hi everyone, my name is Andreas Sodoru. I'm a PhD student and a recently appointed teaching fellow at the University of Bath. And I'm going to give you a short talk about, uh, well, not really a short one for being one hour and a half, uh, about how you can build modular intelligent agents using behavior oriented design and cognitive architecture. This talk is essentially like a theatrical cut of the AI module we have been offering to the University of Bath to our final year undergraduate students and MSc students for the last seven years. It's pretty much compressed down to one hour of a talk plus 30 minutes at the end for you guys if you want to download a small game I made for you to download and make some agents yourself. And even we can even have a competition today or tomorrow and see if someone can make it the best team of agents and win in the capture the flag game. Essentially, uh, this is AI 101. So I'm gonna go through all the basics. Before I'm, I'm, I'm moving to more about action selection and learning systems, go into cognitive architectures, what they are, how we, how we use them, why do we need to use them. Before I move into behavior the design, one of these cognitive architectures, give you some examples how we have been using it. And because I think it's, when you get the opportunity to talk about something, especially from the beginning, you should also, also include all the ethics, all the good practices. It's similar when you teach programming. When I teach programming to year one undergraduate students, instead of just teaching them this is an object-oriented language, you use it like that and that, we also teach them all the clean code practices, single responsibility principle and all that, and we hope that they will use them in the future. They don't always use them, but that's another story. But I thought it would be nice to give you some overview of that part as well. And at the end, there will be a Q&A, &A and, and people, you are more than welcome if you manage to download the game to maybe build some agents together. So this is, as I said, this is a theatrical cut of Dr. Jonas Bryson's ICCS course. And it's, it's all about this, how you can develop complete and complex agents. What we mean by complete is an agent that acts on its own. It's not part of a multi-agent system. It can still work in a team with other agents, but it doesn't rely to be in the team for it to operate. And what we mean by co a complex agent is an agent who has multiple conflicting goals. Let's start with a small video. Oh, okay. Can, can anyone make a guess what the, vid what the robot is doing in this video? I'll give you like a minute to see it, and if anyone can make a wild guess, that would be great. Some other guesses? Searching for something. For what? So, let's see what, what it happens with a human. It ignores the human, continues going around. Let me put it a bit forward. PowerPoint is awful when it comes to videos. And it's not just does some lighting stuff. No one wants to update their guesses or anything? S no. No. So all of you, you pretty much make guesses based on what you saw on the video, based on what you saw in the environment. This goes to show that we don't have any theory of mind when it comes to robots. Instead, we try to make guesses based on the objects on the environment, based on the objects are, are that the, the you know, robot operates around, and based on even sci science fiction. Uh, but more about that later. At the moment, let me just tell you that this robot, it took the developer once uh, 20 pounds to make. It uses an Arduino board, some light sensors, and what it's doing is going around and using a heat detector, tries to find a human. If, if there is heat, it, it considers that that's a human, and it flashes some lights. The whole thing, it's using BOD, behavior oriented design, and it took the, the developer, once the system was in place, when the plan was in place, only like 10 minutes to develop. And this is the purpose of the workshop, it's, pr it's pretty much to help you understand how you can make such agents that fast. So, can I not make it? So, agents. This is a term I will be using a lot. I know that if you don't have any AI background, which I don't know if, if all of you have or not, 
we, uh, when we say an agent, it's an intelligent agent, it's any autonomous entity that can observe its environment and act on that environment using actuators. For example, in the chatbot example that you had, the ch uh, chatbot workshop that you had earlier this morning, the agent uses some sensors, which in this case is like text inputs from the user, and then responds back to the user. So that's the action, the output. So agent is any entity that, that's pretty much observes its environment and alters it. And what is an intelligent system? It's another way to describe AI. And the f ironic thing is, if you were in, a in the AI in the 90s, people were saying that they are in intelligent systems. Why? Because people were trying to disassociate themselves with AI back then. Because there was uh, this whole group with from philosophers saying artificial general intelligence and what this came now to be the singularity. Back then, it was called artificial general intelligence, and people were actively trying to disassociate themselves in order to get more grants, more research and development, especially after all the break, of after all the roadblocks that they hit in the 80s when neural networks and all subversion machines and all this came out, and they found out that they couldn't run them because they didn't have enough hardware by processing power at the time. So what is intelligent? Can I not make a guess? Someone else? Intelligence is always defined by doing the right thing at the right time. And that requires search. What you are saying is actually cognition, the ability to adapt on a dynamic environment. So to act when we say to you are acting intelligently, it's because we make, you make this decision that we consider to be the right at the time. That's why we have, if someone does something that we can't justify, we call him stupid. But that requires search. So intelligence actually aims to focus the search by using biases, which comes from learning, like machine learning, or action selection mechanisms, which provide constraints. So, but search, that's the main problem in AI. Because it takes time, and it has a cost, a computational cost. So we actively try to limit the search space either by using constraints in actual selection mechanism, or even conduct part of it beforehand by training our neural networks or whatever else learning algorithms we are using beforehand. But more about search later. And back to cognition. Cognition is real-time search, the ability to adapt. But it can also be slow, because cognition takes lots of resources. And it can be a certain. The results that it can uh, come out of it it may not be what we wanted. And by that time, it will be too late for us to act. Which is why some species, like plants, while plants are actually intelligent, they don't have cognition, or they limit it. I, in case you didn't know, plants, we consider them intelligent, because, for example, when there is light, they move towards the light, and so on. That's an act of intelligence, but at the same time, it's not real-time search. Like we humans, we became the dominant species in the planet because a few thousand years ago, we had the cognitive revolution. We developed language, we developed social structure, and through that, through that cognition, we became the dominant species because it allowed us to adapt fast and efficient in dynamic environments. So do we actually need systems that are cognitive? Yes. But not all systems need to be cognitive, and at the same time, not all systems need to, be, to have the same cognition level. In general, as a rule of thumb, I always say that any system that is proactive or interactive needs to have some cognition. Now, it's up to the developer to decide how much the real-time search is needed. So in AI, in order to make things efficient, we try to limit search and allow cognition from the design of the agent. So how do we actually build cognitive systems? It's like software engineering. You need some parts that in AI we call them ontology, because we're fancy. We need a, an architecture to arrange those parts together, which is a cognitive architecture. And we need a way to develop them, a, a development methodology. It's like in software engineering. You can have your middleware in PHP, front-end in HTML, back-end in MySQL, and connect them all together with a model via controller and using an agile methodology, uh, an agile scrum, let's say. 
But when it comes to, co to cognitive architectures, when it comes to AI, one thing you find out is that actually the architecture makes assumptions about ontology and often dictates which development methodology you have to use. So it's not like software in development where you can say, I'm going to build this system like this using waterfall because I live in the 80s. But uh, when it comes to AI, more or less the, ar the architecture will define you how you're going to build it, what methodology you have to use. So what are those parts? All systems, actually, they share primitives. They all have primitives. Primitives are all the sensory inputs that the system can have and all the actions that it can have, it can take through actuator, actuators. They all have search functions. It can be one or it can be, ma or it can be many. And these search functions can be either learning from machine learning or action selection mechanisms like reactive planning, which we're going to see later. Some of them, they may have a goal selection mechanism. Not all of them require multiple goals. If you just have a face ID, for example, on your iPhone, its job is always to find the if, if your job is sorry, if that face that it facing the phone is the right one to unlock the phone. That's the goal of the system. But if that system actually becomes part, a module of a greater system, then the greater system may have multiple goals. For example, a self-driving car, it can, have multiple, it can have as a goal to drive someone home, but at the same time, it has as a goal to protect the passenger or protect its environment, protect the car, and so on. And depending on the system, you may end up finding that you need more and more. For example, machine learning in neural networks, you may need a feedback mechanism to incorporate feedback. So when it comes to search functions, like learning, as you know, the current whole thing is actually this in AI, machine learning. And through learning, what we are trying to do is always find the optimal parameter values, which requires primitives, actions, uh, actuators, and sensors, and parameters. What we mean by that is if you have a behavior, let's say avoid hitting a wall, you have a parameter value, which, sorry, you have a sensor, let's say an ultrasonic sensor that detects how far away you are from the wall. You have a parameter, which is, can be, let's say, eight meters. When, when you are between eight meters from a wall, you decide, I'm going like, to go away. But that may not be the optimal. So with machine learning, like genetic algorithms, you can optimize that. And instead of eight meters, you can start going away from the wall at two meters. An evolution, biological and social evolution that we humans have, actually are just special types of learning. But machine learning in general, because of this, because it's trying to solve the optimization problem, is really good at detecting patterns. And those patterns can be in actually in actions that someone can take in order to detect, to make something, to reach a, a certain goal, which is how, for example, AlphaGo what uh, is doing. AlphaGo is really good at detecting patterns in plays in, in, in how you play Go, and by optimizing the movements in the, in the, in the game of Go, it, reach, uh, it can reach its goal, which is to win the match. But learning always takes a significant role in cognition, and there are various ways to achieve learning S like supervised learning, as you know, where you have labeled data unsupervised, where you have data and you provide the labels after, semi-supervised, you do a mix and match, or reinforcement learning, where you, you have a, a reward function for the algorithm. But regardless of the approach you take, it always takes time, and it always requires some data. And one thing that a university, which I would not name, found out after spending three million in social robotics, they found out that there are not enough data to model the whole world to just use machine learning in everything. So the, after spending three millions and three years of R&D, they found out that they couldn't have their robots going around the environment because it wouldn't understand anything, because they didn't have enough data. But that's another story. All systems, all, all machine learning systems, they always have a representation, a model, that can be generated on the go, like in reinforcement learning, pre-train, or train, or, and, or keep updating itself uh, if you have a feedback mechanism. But that's a bias, and that's something that quite a few people, especially psychologists, if you are in a, an AI conference with psychologists, they don't get, is that AI has the same biases as us, 
not only because of the data that we fit into the algorithm, but because we select which model we're going to use. And the moment you select a model, you incorporate a bias, a bias from the designer, because the designer needs to make a choice which model it's going to use. And at the end, that model may not be the ideal. Different, different tasks can work better with different models. All systems require a means of acting, which goes back to the primitives. And as mathematicians say, there is no free lunch. No free lunch is an expression used by mathematicians in machine learning to indicate that by the, the computational cost the designer needs to, to have to find a suitable solution for its data set, for his data set, can be as much as the solution finding an actual solution to the problem. And that you can see it from neural networks at GAs, two quite popular approaches. Neural networks, the, everything you see here in colors actually, are things that the developer needs to decide, the developer needs to optimize, and even if you use one algorithm, like a genetic algorithm, to optimize a neural network, which was a really popular thing to do in the 90s, you will still end up having to optimize a genetic algorithm. So there is no way you can go around that of introducing some biases in your model, or you to have to spend time and effort on making op optimization changes in your model. Which brought actually action selection? a way to add constraints to the system. Action selection, as I said, intelligence is just by express behavior. And then it's a judgment done by both people and natural selection in nature. But action selection aims, action selection mechanism aims at finding the right behavior at the right time based on a, a dynamic environment. It aims at expressing, uh, expressing the right behavior to act intelligently and also to optimality at the actions performed to reach a certain goal. Uh, not only, well, if you probably know oh, there was symbolic AI first, which I'm not going to cover, which are all these if-else statements. But then we ended up having production systems, formal and optimal planning, reactive dynamic planning, and learning plans. Let's go through them. Production system was back in the 70s and 80s. The main thing, and that was what uh, natural language processing uh, systems like ELISA, all these formal systems uh, were based on. So you only have a set of tuples. Each one of them is if x true, perform y. It's really symbolic, a symbolic representation of the world. So you are, if that changes in the world, you perform that. And based on the order of the tuples, the system will make a decision. So if the the highest priority table that gets activated, it will just activate that. But human behavior cannot be expressed only by, by the environment. I mean, I can get hungry. That's not the environment that changes, it's just me, my internal state. So that brought forward formal and optimal planning, where you have multiple goals, you have a description for each goal, you still have a way to express the environment, and a set of possible actions that you can take. For example, if, I want, if my goal now is to go to Tokyo, I have as an action to continue talking to you, I have as an action to buy a ticket, I have as an action to go to the airport, and as an action to board a, a flight. So if I want to go to Tokyo, I ignore the first action, and I set in sequence, buy the ticket, go to the airport, board my flight. And that set of actions in row, it's what we call a plan in AI. It's an optimization problem, which is why most of the research conducted in this area ended up being all these pathfinding algorithms that we use in video games. So how you end up making the most efficient plan to reach from state A to state B, from state A, which would be being, being in Cluj, to state B, which would be me being in Tokyo. But describing the world is also hard. It, and it's especially if you don't know the word, the word that the robot, your robot, your agent will operate in, it's, it can reduce its liability. And as Brooks the, the wor said, the word is its own best model. Brooks is, if you don't know, the a was the MIT's AI director and one of the leading people in AI for a long time until he, no, he's still alive, but 
he, he went up, he, uh, he stopped being an ac in academia now. Uh, but yeah, Brooks is one of the leading people in AI, and actually we're going to use one of his cognitive architectures, because he created the first cognitive architecture, uh, as an example later. S and actually then it went to reactive planning, which actually Brooks made it. So Bru uh, reactive planning is I mean, it's action selection by lookup. And there are three ways to do it. Environmental de determinist, finite state machines, which are all computer scientists known and love, or love and hate, uh, and basic reactive plans. Due to time constraints, we're going to go only to the last one, basic reactive plans. So reactive planning is, again, a prioritized list of actions. But unlike formal planning, where you have the uh, list of actions determined at the moment, so you have a pool of actions, and you have to pick which actions are, you're going to take, in reactive planning, you already decide which actions are you're going to take to satisfy a goal in advance. So in advance, I know if I want to get full, like stop being hungry, I know in advance I'm going to get a banana. But also, I know that its action requires a stimuli from the previous, that can influence the previous action taken. So if I, when I get a banana, only then, when I have the banana, I can peel it, and then I can eat it and eventually end up being full. But this allows reactive planning to actually operate in a much more timely fashion, and even in architectures like an Arduino. Our, uh, our reactive planning instinct in, uh, in the Arduino, it's only like 20 kilobytes, and really just runs thousands of operations a minute, sorry, uh, because it just, it just, you don't need any real-time search. You only need to search which is the current goal and use your environmental and uh, your environmental stimuli to select which goal you're going to need to take now because it works with interruptions. But more in a bit. But yes, and then learning plans. Because machine learning people were like, hey, we want to get into this too. So learning plans came afterwards, and there are two ways to achieve them. You either use a, s a formal or reactive plan, you use a machine learning algorithms to optimize the plans, or some, some really good cool solutions used by in video games, actually, like the, the game DEFCON, where they were using behavior trees, which is a, a cognitive architecture which uses reactive planning, and they were using a GA to optimize this plan structure. A colleague of mine was using uh, reactive planning alongside, uh, I think it was a, a deep neural network, to optimize the parameter values inside the plans to play Super Mario. Or you can also have learning plans by learning through observation to create a model of knowledge of its actions. And that's actually how uh, AlphaGo debugs, uh, how DeepMind debugs AlphaGo. They have AlphaGo output a plan of all the actions it took, and then they can go through the actions and see what it, why it went with what it went, why it decided this action now, why it decided to go with that action now, and so on. But even if you know all the parts of the system, if you have them all, you just, you just can't throw them in the box and say, OK, I will make an agent now. Instead, you need a way to connect these parts, which is why we have architectures. Cognitive architectures, they always assume an ontology, as I said. They always require some specific parts. And more often than not, because cognitive architectures they are associated with working code, whatever that is reactive planning or formal planning, or they may be associated with a specific machine learning algorithm. They assume an ontology. And at the same time, they all nearly always dictate which development methodology you need to take. But at the same time, the main focus is to answer the question, where do you put the cognition? to offer some control over the biases the system may have through learning, or any or biases, sorry, or offer control over the constraints of the system. But in, in essence, it's just all about limiting the search space. Because as I said, search is really the biggest problem in AI, finding that right action to take at that time. This is a modular, a real-time AI agent, more or less. 
you always have your perception and action modules at the very bottom, which are the largest part of your code. And each module can be different. You can reuse them. And then you, on top of that, you have a decision-making mechanism which makes call in the different modules over here. So, you know, and it's the decision-making mechanism picks which actions it needs to take based on stimuli that comes from the perception modules. And the decision-making mechanism picks which actions it needs to take based on the current goal of the agent, which is determined by the top part. So essentially, there is a connection between all three parts going from top to bottom. The goals arbitration mechanism selects which goal you currently need to look at. The decision-making mechanism selects which actions are ideal at the time to, to make that goal. And the, and the action modules take these actions, while the perception modules, more often than not, they go back to the, to the goal arbitration and they say, this goal was satisfied, or this, oh, this happened at the environment, or this is my eternal state now, maybe you should switch to a new goal. And based on this, Brooks came with subception architecture in 86, and since then has been successfully used by four robots, four different robots at MIT, and I think it was used in a game as well. And I know that the derivative of it, GOB, was used in FIAR, in the, in the video game FIAR in 2002. And since FIAR, actually, GOB has been used in its sequels and to a few other, uh, to a few other games. So subception architecture by Brook was quite simple. It's quite simple to understand. It's you have each behavior in a, on a different layer, so you can have avoid objects as one layer of behavior, in that be and as the name suggests of that layer, all it needs to take care of is avoiding hitting in anyone. Then you have another layer which can be wander around to go around the room. Uh, and then you can have another one which is the explore world, so you can do mapping of the environment that you are. But each one of them, each layer has a different priority, and the bottom one has the highest priority, because it's, there is no good in avoiding hitting an object while you are wandering around. So you need to first avoid uh, hitting someone, and then continue uh, wandering around. So what happens is, you have all your sensors information, and which are and synchronously, it, they keep providing information to the different layers. So at all times, even while the robot is wandering around, even when this behavior is being used, avoid objects can be at any moment be triggered because an object was detected. And when that happens, it takes control of the actuators. It takes control of uh, the resources of the robot. And it's the same with us humans. This is based on behavior by Minsky, one of the founders of AI. I, we humans, if you, let's say I'm, I'm coding, but I suddenly I'm hungry, I get hungry. Hungry is more important than coding sometimes. But when, when, it's, when that happens, the, uh, my goal is to satisfy hunger. So that takes control over my body, and I decide I'm going to stop coding, and I switch to the behavior to satisfy hunger, which is me going to the kitchen, and end up making coffee, because I saw the coffee machine. It's, it's uh, all peeling a banana and eating the banana. But in essence, what happens is each behavior takes control. And it's all about the fight. When you have multiple goals, it's all about the fight between the different goals. Which one is going to take control of the robot? Which one is going to take control of the system at that time to satisfy its goal, while allowing other goals to interrupt? And as you see, there is an arrow here from the actuators back to the sensors because this is an agent. It not only acts on the environment, it by acting on the environment, it changes the environment, which means new readings need to take place. So what Brooks came up with this assumption is that they need to decompose behavior instead of having everything to a big action selection mechanism and saying, yeah, if that happens, do that, and or if that happens, do that, and so on. Instead of start creating more modular agents by decomposing the sub-behaviors and, and having each module into a layer responsible for a behavior combinance. In fact, that was so, it's so pop his approach is so popular to this day that all cognitive architectures and most, act and most action selection mechanisms 
may use his approach. Uh, he was the first one who thought from this sensing to a behavior, from behavior to action, and back to the sensing. His approach was using infinity state machines at that time, where you have each layer, set of augmented infinity state machines, which dictate the current state of the layer. So it can be, um, I'm using, so it can be, for example, in avoid objects, it can be one state, I'm not hitting anything. Oh, then suddenly there's sensor information that I'm near an object, so it's gonna move from it's gonna move inside to another state, which is me going on reverse, not to hit the object, and then going back to the other state, which was I'm not hitting anything. Nothing is at sight, so there there is no need to change the state, no need to use this behavior. But as I said, the main thing here is that this is a fight for resources. And this is based on us, our, on, our, on our human or behavior. And, complex, and that's how complex agents be came to be, by having multiple conflicting goals. Not every, system, not every uh, agent needs to be a complex agent. So, as I said, some of them, they just can have one goal, and that's fine. But when you start thinking about driverless cars, when you start thinking about games AI and so on, you start having more and more goals that the agent may need to have. And that's why you need complex agents. And that's an important design consideration. Because it's, you, may, you have multiple goals. For example, your agent's goal may be still be to drive around. Your driverless car's goal is still to drive you around. But it can also have goals to avoid hitting something. But that's against, that is against its original utility, which brings the problem of dithering. So it's when an, an agent switches between goals so fast that it ends up not doing anything. Which is an important research topic on its own, how you avoid tethering. And that's why you need learning, because with learning you introduce biases, and through biases and memory, you can say, okay, I'm more biased that in this case I'm gonna do this over this action. Or that this goal is more appropriate to take. Or that's even how emotions work. One of the reasons that we humans don't have tethering is actually not only because of our own implicit biases, but also of our, of our emotional triggers. So if we get angry or something, that stops us doing anything else. But that allows us to perform a behavior from the beginning to the end. But not all goals can be conflicting, especially in video games where you can have multiple goals and you are talking about virtual agents. You can have your agent do multiple things at the same time. So, I created a small game for you guys in Unity. And the idea is that you have a team of five, people, uh, five agents against five other agents. If anyone wants to download it, that would be great. I'm gonna show you a little bit later how you can do, develop agents in it. I put the download link now because I heard that the internet is really slow. Uh, so if anyone wants to play around with it, it would be great. I also put it submissions, competition folder there. So if anyone wants to export the pref a prefab of their team and its plans, we can even run a competition tomorrow if there are enough submissions. This is something we do at Bath. Uh, in at Bath, we use Unreal Tournament 2004. Uh, we have our students make uh, capture the flag agents for, for it, and then we have a huge competition where uh, students play with their teams against other, team, other, other teams and whoever wins gets the last 10% of the coursework, uh, the last 10% of the marks. So behavior rendered is, oh, sorry, you wanna take it out. So behavior rendered design. Behavior rendered design was developed by Bryson, Joanna Bryson, uh, during her time at MIT. And it's used as abbreviation through hierarchical dynamic plans, which are called POSH, because they are POSH. Uh, it aims against, like Brooks, to behavior decomposition. But this time, you have specialized representations of that behavior. Unlike Brooks, where you just have finite state machines for all behaviors, for all possible behaviors. But again, each module provides its own perception and actions. 
But this allows you to have all the search within the module. Once you decide, once your goal application picks a goal to take, any search is done within the module. And that saves so much time and effort when ca computational costs. But it's not only an architecture, it's a development methodology because it's actively trying to promote an iterative agile development. So these are the special life structures that BOD uses. Drive collections, which are some things that need to be checked at all times. So these are the goals, let's say, that the system, the high level goals the system can have. It has some competences, which can only be used in particular context. Some action patterns, with a set of primitives, of primitive actions, that need always to take place one after the other, and some senses and actions, which are the far bottom leaves of the graph, let's say, the primitives. And to give you a better example, this is a StarCraft uh, plan for StarCraft broad Broadworks. If you know, we are actually in the, uh, in the games AI community, we have been using StarCraft as a play through uh, as a playground to test new techniques and there are in fact 11 AI StarCraft competitions every year uh, for academics but everyone can apply and put their own thing if you want to but in beyond D for example in this plan you have your drive collection at the very at the very top which is to survive let's say the hive mind survival because this is Zerx it's one of the functions so its goal is always to stay alive and then you have different drive elements, which can trigger different things. For example, one of, and they have different priorities. So the higher up you are, the higher priority it has. You can have spawn drones, for example, which can trigger an element. So if you have less than 15 drones, that drive element is going to be triggered instantly. And then the accompaniments can be triggered, which accompaniments have a goal. To see if you can still, if you, if the game is not over yet, you can still spawn drones. Or let's say this one is build a base. So if you it triggers an element, say right away, to construct buildings. Sorry, if you if you if you don't have buildings, you need to build a base. So you trigger a competence called build base. And uh, while the base is not complete, you're still going to be triggering this and this again and again until your base is finished, until a sense that says, I have the buildings that I need is satisfied, until that goal is satisfied. Or to give you a better example, actually, let me. This is from. Ah. This is from Capture the Flag. So you have your drives, which one can be score flag, which has a higher priority for me because it's Capture the Flag. And I can also kill enemies because I'm violent. So, I, I can, so I, these are my two drives. And based on if I see an enemy, this drive can be activated. This has another drive. If I don't have the flag, if I have the flag, sorry, I don't have the flag, I need to first grab it. So I activate an action pattern to move the flag and then grab it. If I have the flag, sorry, if the flag is not owned by my team, then I can go to score the flag. If I hold the flag, because this uh, behavior was activated and was executed, and I managed to grab the flag from the enemy. Otherwise, I'm gonna, if I don't have the flag, then I have to move around, and so on. So it goes on in order of priority. But at the same time, Maybe I just see an enemy. So even if I hold the flag, or if I'm moving around and so on, and I see an enemy, maybe this drive maybe need to be executed because my goal changed. My goal now is survival. So I can start shooting back because I have someone I'm taking damage. Or I saw an enemy randomly, you know, walking around. So maybe I will go with shoot, da with shoot enemies and use this competence, which if I'm allowed to shoot at the moment, if it's the enemy is in range, I'm going to shoot the enemy. So it's, it's more about you need to make a good plan. And once you make, once you make all the back end pieces, all the, the plan that runs the plan, developing the plan is much more trivial. Just to give you an example, this is 
This is the game in Unity. And this is my team. As you see, they're quite dumb. They just move and they don't look around. They, they just move like this. Who moves like that? Come on. So I need to find a way for them to just look around, right? I mean, to move to, towards where they're moving. So what I'm going to do is, let's see our code. These are, this is a bit my behavior library, the collection of all the primitives, of all the senses I have. I'm going around it. Let's see, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I have a method already. I already have an action. Look at next, uh, at nav point. So that's because I'm using nav point to move my agents around the game, because I'm cheating, because this is games AI. I can, I can point them towards where I'm looking at. So what I can do is, I just get the, I get, just get the action name, go to my XML file, and where am I? Grab a flat, oh, yeah. So I have a, the action pattern move around. So I just add it, that's an action now. <coughs> now if I rerun this, Yeah, so the ones that use that plan, they started moving their heads around. So I need to update my other plan because I, had, I have some of my teams going in towards the enemy flag and, and while I have some other members of the team just moving around randomly in case they find someone to shoot at. But it's that simple. Let's see. Oh, and that now they, when they start taking damage, I need to find a way for them to also look towards why they're taking damage. So if I go back into the behaviors that my agent has, I can just do a simple new behavior, like since I already know look at, and BOND allows all the memory is inside the module. So you have your inside the module where you take damage for in this case. So I just write a new behavior, which would be a public void, Look at damage. And I use my look at method. Damage location. And now can I just add that I just can I just that behavior to my plan and my agents will start looking towards where they're taking damage. So they can shoot back to the enemy because they will have virtual confirmation that they can shoot it at. It's that simple, really. And this has a side effect. By once you develop your behavior library and everything, you as the AI developer, you don't really need to worry anymore about the behaviors of the agent. Instead, if, it, if this is for video games, you can have your uh, games developers, your games designers, to edit their behavior themselves, because creating a plan is much more simple than writing code. So once they understood, once you create all the background code and the planner and you make sure that they don't have any bugs and everything, it, the designer can take it charge. Or in terms of companies, if you are, doing, if you are using, let's say, AI for gamification or, or for something else, you are experienced designer, your business analyst, your psych in-house psychologist or whoever, whoever decides which, the, which are the behaviors of the agent needs to have, can take control. And that's how games like Halo or Fear, they ended up being so popular. And when they came out, people were like, it has so much advanced AI. It's because what they, what in both games, what they did is, they had a single AI developer who did all the background work, and then they left the uh, games designers to the, their own thing. Because they could uh, just edit the plans or the behavior trees in games of Halo. Hi. <laughs> ah, he went back to the beginning. So the way you do beyond this, you first decide which behaviors your agent needs to do, an initial decomposition of behavior. 
And these are the specifications. And then you try to scale the system. You start first, first by co coding some primitives that your system may need uh, for each behavior, and you edit the plan, or you cre start creating your own plan. So you check one behavior at a time. You test the bug, simplify your design to make sure you are using more plan instead of unnecessary code, and you go back, and so on. So it's, it's an iterative process, really. You are always try to describe acti activities as a sequence of actions, whatever those are competences, which are things that you may need to check based on the current context, or action patterns, which are things that always will take place in a specific order. You need to identify which are your sensory and action primitives. And you need to identify the state necessary for the primitives. And then prioritize the goals, which is for me is one of the most important things. Because there is no use for your agent to go and corrupt, uh, capture the flag if it's taking damage. And you go on like that until you, you implement all your behaviors. And go back to primitives. These are simple examples. These are sense values. So for one of them, it's like all target dead. And I just return back a boolean if, or if there are any enemies still spotted or not. Or if I have any enemies spotted, I, re I return back if I see enemies or not. And these are just simple blocks of code, really simple to implement. And once you implement them once, you can use them all over your plan because you just refer to them by name. And then you have the actions, which, as you saw, it's the same thing. You, have, you can turn to damage or shoot, for example, and it's that simple. It some, uh, some behaviors, some actions, actually, in some pl uh, BOD planners, instead of returning back void, that it use, they may return back a value, like zero, to confirm that the action was, t uh, was successful or not. In case of the Unity game, because I developed it three weeks ago, I didn't have time to do that. But it's in, the in plans, eventually. But yes, essentially, this is a trade-off or representation. Behaviors like code or plans. And that's what you need to decide, how much of these behaviors can go into the coding part, or how much it can go into the plan. I always prefer to put as much things into the plan and try to make have as simple design in code as possible. Because this way you can also avoid redundancy. Because you can still, if, if, if you have the same code again and again, it just, it's bad. And it's really hard to debug it, it's really hard to keep it maintained and everything. But if you have, if you reuse the same structure in the plan, it's much simpler for the planner as well, because it will just point to the same memory address that it keeps it in the planner, that element, that plan structure. And, uh, and Joan actually always advised, if you end up having too complicated components, try to think again how you can make them more primitives, or to split large behavior. So this is more or less based on all obscure in the programming. You have some plan structure that you keep using, and again and again, you keep using the same instances of the plan structure. You keep using the same instances of your primitives, of your modules. It's all about modularity. And to keep everything simple, and keep any memory inside the modules. And that means if you want to use, let's say, a machine learning system, let's say to, to to identify people, you can still do that. You can still use a, a, your favorite machine learning algorithm to do object identification and be inside one module. And any memory, anything related to that, will only be used when that module is called, which saves more memory, more of your running memory. And again, it's all about agile development. We have been using, actually, BOD for quite a bit. Uh, Twinstinct, the small robot that you saw. That's, one, that's another planner like Posh. Robot World, which is available on GitHub, and you can actually create more rob virtual robots that go around a room if you want to. And Posh. We have been using Posh with some people from 
Charles University, uh, the Pokemon team, for quite a bit of time now for a real tournament. We started with the original real tournament and then we moved to 2004. Not we have been using the path mainly to teach AI to our undergrads, but uh, Pokemon went a bit further and they actually got the sponsorship by 2K, the publisher behind Unreal, and in 2007 they, they had a 2K competition where they have a team of, uh, of bots and some humans, another team of some bots and humans, and a third team of judges. And the judges' job was to observe the match and shoot whoever they thought it was a human. And in 2007 they managed to beat the Turing test. And one team from Texas University, Austin, Texas. What they did is they used uh, some GAs and neural networks to optimize plants. So they, they had a, the machine learning algorithm to generate lots of plants, different behaviors. And they had different bots in their team that had different behaviors which were based on real humans. And they used that. And they managed to be the Turing test like that. And two years after, in 2009, they decided to rerun the competition. And again, another team managed to beat the Turing test. So yeah, we already beat the Turing test, in case you didn't know. <coughs> and we actually used it on StarCraft as well, including an AIDA competition. That's one of the uh, AI uh, games, uh, AI development, inter interactive development, something like that. It's one of the com a academic conference for games AI. And then we ended up with about three, which is so a snapshot actually. We, and the main purpose of about three is not only to allow people to develop plants in a more ID kind of way, because you can see your plan, you can click on the plan and be like, add new behavior. Instead of having to edit a Lisp file, as it was the case before, or an XML file, as is the case on the, on the game I made, you start to use your own plan editor and you just edit things there. So it's much more visual. But it also allows a real-time debugging of the agent, which you're going to see in a bit. And this is something I've been doing now, the sustainability game, where I have multiple agents, a colony of agents actually, and the user selects how much time they're going to spend on different things. And we're using that with uni Princeton University and Joshua Institute of Technology to do behavior change, because we want to see how we to influence how people make public investments. So instead of just one thing we notice is that people tend, based on their cultural background, they tend to do like p be more altruistic or and tend to be more antisocial when it comes to or be more free riders when it comes to public investments in, in public goods. So we are hoping through by having players to play the game and see how their agents make decisions using a boat that that will change their perception and start understanding that they need a more mixed strategy if they want the world to stay sustainable for everyone. And uh, then there's also Bank, which is a, 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 the Unity game I made, and I hope people manage to download, but I don't see lots of laptops, so. Uh, so yeah, it was actually based on Stam Armina's code, with who organized a Unity AI tournament, and I built on top of that code a planner for Porsche, and it actually allows real-time debugging if you have a boat, which I'm going to show you how. But let's go to the ethics and the last part of the presentation about transparency, which is my research, actually. Let me ask you, how far will you trust a robot? You walk into a house, you see this robot there, and it tells you to go to the fridge and open, open the fridge, get the juice, and pour it over the plants. Will anyone do this? If the robot tells you to, if, if there are some mails, uh, uh, some envelopes, sealed envelopes on the table, uh, will the, and the robot tells you go and open and read them, will you do that? Anyone will do that? Ninety percent of the people in this, in this study, they put the juice over the flowers, and all of them, one hundred percent, they opened the envelopes and they read the letters, even if none of them were addressed to them. And when they were asked later why they did that, their responses were more or less among the lines, the robot told me to, it's more intelligent than me. <laughs> In reality, the robot was just faulty. 
but no one spot that. Instead, everyone thought, it's a robot, it must be more intelligent than me, it must know what it's doing, it's in the house, and so on. But no one thought that it was a faulty robot, it was just fo genuinely faulty. So why do, why do we trust them so much? Maybe it's because we don't understand their actions. As you saw in the video at the beginning, if you just see a robot going around, you don't understand what they are doing, do you? You just try to make some connection, maybe based on the environment, based on maybe based on your other beliefs. Like those people, they were like, oh, it's a robot, it must be more intelligent than me. That's because we don't have a theory of mind. They are just design artifacts. They are not evolved. And because we're not equipped with neither genetic nor social evolution to deal with machine agency, we just don't understand them. We understand each other because of similarity. If I see someone of you like uh, snoozing or closing his eye like the guy over there, it's because I know that he's tired or bored, but that's because I understand, it. I understand his behavior I've, because of similarity. But when it comes to AI, if I see an AI to go on s and sleep at the back of the room, I would probably assume that it's because it's tired. But in reality, is it really tired? No. It's because it fakes that tiredness. It fakes similarity. And, it, and me, I just believe that that's what is, uh, what, that's what is true. And, that, and it's even more complicated with robots and in general AI, because you can develop them in a myriad ways. You can have from production systems that like you saw today to have a, just a big black box and neural network to make all the decisions. And that changes again the way that a, a robot can behave. Even if two robots look the same, they can be programmed in completely different ways. So we end up making our own models at the moment based on science fiction and our own beliefs. We ha don't have any theory of mind, which makes us f make things up. We make us make guesses of what they are doing. Make us make sometimes quite wild guesses of what the robot is feeling, which doesn't really feel, it's fake feeling. But still, we may assume that it's making, it feels, because we see that it's faking that. And that makes us all vulnerable users. So <coughs> one of my arguments actually in my research is the need to open this black box of which we call AI. So what is transparency? which is the way to open it, if you just tell you transparency, that's quite vague, isn't it? I mean, and if you probably read any AI ethics uh, news lately uh, on the internet, you see oh, everyone saying, oh, you need to have transparency. But what does it mean? I'm a software engineer by trade. For me, I like specifications. I like to know this and this and this. That's what is transparency. So some people actually said, oh, it's maybe provided the source code. But is that enough? I mean, we are engineers, we can understand source code, but do you want your grandma to go th and learn Java so you can understand why it's her Roomba stops working when the cat enters the room? No, you don't. Because this way you just shift the burden of responsibility from you, the developer, to the end user. So transparency for us at Bath, as we defined it, is to have the whole decision mechanism all, uh, as an always on, on demand, uh, able to provide interpretation of what it's doing, why it's doing so. In other words, the goals, process, process towards goals, and the sensory inputs. In other words, the environmental perception the agent has, and any unexpected behavior or error message it may display, it may have, instead of just hiding them. So we actually took the same video as before, and this time, it runs with about three in debug mode. So the things that light up are actually the different behaviors in the plan, the different drives, the different competences, the different action patterns. And as they pop, they, they pop up based on how they were used at that time. And we took that video and we sent it to a bunch of people. And then we asked them some questions. Do you think the robot is thinking? Is the robot intelligent? Can you? tell what the robot is doing, and, and describe maybe the task, and uh, all these different questions, and we score them. And we came up with these results. People who didn't have access to Apollo 3, they tend to think that they have a much uh, 
poorer understanding of the objective of what the robot was up to, they didn't think that they could understand it, and they have a much lower mental model accuracy, which means understanding the task that the robot was trying to do, or what the robot was capable of doing, while its lights were flashing. But we recreated the experiment in person this time at the Science Museum, and we had people, knife users from the who are just going there in the Science Museum to with their families. And we had in real time a both three in a monitor and the robot going around. And we replicated the whole experiment and we came with similar results. Again, you can see a metal, an increased metal model accuracy if you have access to a both three, if you had access to that additional transparency information. So people were able to understand, oh, it's doing that, and this is because this is the functionality that the robot can do, and up to that. So the people, and actually, if, if in some cases where we didn't have a both three, and people filled up the questionnaires, and then we gave them a both three, they were all like, oh, that was that, that's all it can do? Because then they started understanding the functionalities of the robot by having access to this additional transparency information. And this is useful because it can allow people to have a better understanding in of uh, uh, sorry, it can have a better understanding of when the robot is way it's behaving the way it is. Otherwise, as literature shows, any misunderstanding can lead to anxiety, mistrust, or fear. And it's even to misuse and disuse. And as a famous study did from Kim and Heinz, it had self-doubt. So they had people wi working with an in this study, they had some people working with a robot, and the robot when was doing something weird, people were always like, was it supposed to do that? Did, did I did something wrong? Not a single one of them thought that the robot was actually faulty. Instead, they were all placing any self, all doubts, all failures on them, because it's a robot and it's perfectly working. Right? And that's why robots can actually end up misleading us if there is not in tr enough transparency. And that mislead can be either intentional, in case of video games, for example, where we actively try to use for audiovisual clues, cues, and other things to have our agents appear more intelligent than what they are. Uh, Pac-Man, it was just using a random, a semi-random approach, but people were like, oh my god, it's using this pattern and it follows the player and all this. No, it wasn't. It was just semi-random. But people were actively trying to see more than it was actually is. Fear, which was highly praised but for its AI. They had uh, the agents. If, if, the, if, any, if any enemy was encountered the player, they would shout over the radio, enemy spotted, call, calling for, back, uh, for backup. That was an audio line. It didn't have any code at all. It wouldn't call for a Fortnite at all, but because as the play game progresses, you meet more enemies. And all the reviewers were like, Fear is an amazing game. If agents call for, when they, uh, the enemies call for a Fortnite, they actually come. No, no one was coming. There was no code at all, but people were actively trying to mislead themselves. But that's a good way. That's an intentional mislead. But what it happens when it's not intentional, like, the robot from that study, or when it's not intentional, when it's a driverless car like Tesla, and you ha you're thinking, oh, it's te Tesla is a good brand, it's invincible, it would do well, and y you end up dying, like the guy a year ago. Yeah. So good transparency actually allows to calibrate trust, to choose to trust or to lose confidence ba based on the current or real time expectations of how the system is performing based on your real-time understanding of the system. But also to help us ac distribute accountability and responsibility. Because accountability, responsibility, and transparency are the three main things you're gonna hear from regulations. How, if, if something goes wrong, which things will go wrong, who will be held accountable, who will be held ac responsible. And if everything is a black box, the wrong people may end up being held accountable or responsible. So you, there will be a need to understand what they are doing, even from a regulation point of view. Uh, I don't know if you heard there was a hedge fund uh, just three, four weeks ago. 
that they were using a neural network to make financial predictions and financial trading. The neural network made them a few millions, 97 million, something like that, you know, some peanuts. But then they realized they couldn't understand how they, the neural network made those millions. So they had to shut it down before the financial, uh, the FCA in America would shut them down. So they had to shut down this whole system and pay it profitable because they had no understanding how it was making what, uh, all that crazy amount of money in no time. And again, something about education. If you are using AI in creative industries, and that's something I found uh, by talking to people who use AI to make movies or to make music, is that when they got started using AI, they were able to understand why the AI thought that this part and this part of the dialogue, for example, work together. They started understanding what it makes in a movie good. And it was the same with uh, chess and go. They AI didn't kill it didn't kill chess, it didn't kill Go, it didn't took those games away from us, as some media say. Instead, it taught us new ways to play those games. It gave us new ways to benchmark ourselves against, it gave us new ways of us to practice against. But also, in general, if you are, especially if you are a social scientist, you can use AI, agent-based modeling, in a way to simulate the environment, to simulate ourselves, and my, one of my predictions is that we will see more and more businesses actually using AI to simulate and predict consumers' behavior when it comes to new products announcement releases or when they design techniques like gamification. So and why do we all need that? Well, regulations are coming. Not only the EU's GDPR, which is a general directive for pro uh, personal uh, Personal responsibility? No. I forgot what it stands for, to be honest. Anyway, so they use GDPR, which is all about data privacy. It's a general directive for privacy something. Okay. Anyway, I was I would not take uh, another guess. But anyway, the GDPR, what, what it will say that all algorithms that are used, they will, if they make any decision that involves you, they would need to be able to understand why they made that decision. So if you go to a bank and the bank says, you can get a mortgage or a loan, and you can only take a loan up to that amount of money based on the GDPR. You are allowed to ask how they came up with that decision. Even if, if and the defense that banks were using in England at least, that, well, the computer told me that it won't be enough anymore. Instead, the, the bank will have to explain how their algorithm came to that decision. And there are more standards. The IEEE Standards Association, which I'm a member of, we are releasing the P7001 next year, I hope, where we are aiming to make transparency a standard. So similar to how you can have your ISO standard about quality control or whatever, that you can have in AI, a stand an IEEE standard, P7001, for example, uh, and you say that your system is sufficiently transparent. And that on all this will be used, I think, even more locally as there are more and more discussion from policymakers. In Britain, I, I've been consulting the British government in the AI all party parliamentary group about establishing pi some policy. So you, it's definitely coming. And that was actually only yesterday, uh, House of Lords, which is one of the two houses in the British parliament, they released a report about AI, how they're going to make some external bodies overseeing the whole AI recent development in Britain, for better or the worse. So my conclusion for the whole talk is that AI building it is not really hard, but picking the right things, the right model, the right architecture, that's a hard thing, because that's when you start introducing a bias to the system. The real hard problem for AI is actually the search, which is why you need to limit it to allow cognition from design. Because there is no single solution to all problems. You cannot have a model that fits all of your data. You cannot have an architecture that, suite that works at all times. But every time you make a decision, every time you try to optimize something, even when you try to use another algorithm to optimize something, you introduce a bias. And that's important. It's not, AI is never going to be that magical thing in the cloud that some psychologists or philosophers say that is going to solve our ethics problem. 
because it would base all its decisions, all its predictions based on data and decisions uh, that were made during its development that humans made. So creating AI is one of them, is one thing, but creating responsible AI, aka AI that can be transparent, it's another thing. So you always, if you're ever gonna develop AI, please always keep in mind that ac about accountability, responsibility, and transparency, which I'm quite certain a uh, speaker tomorrow, uh, Virginia Dignum, will definitely mention. So transparency helps us develop, uh, also helps us developers to debug our agents. If we are able to understand what they are doing, can help us debug them. And I would like to say a small thank you to the rest of my research group, John Ambrise, my supervisor, from uh, who is at Bath and Princeton, Rob Wortham, the creator of Instinct, and that little robot that you saw earlier, and to the rest members of the, my group.